Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Very good. All right, let's get started. Apologies for wearing this silly hat. I'm very cold, or at least I feel very cold. I got the second vaccine dose yesterday and uh, I have fever symptoms today. So the goal of today is to just do a bunch of problems relating to the topics in chapters five and chapter six, especially the end of chapter five and all of chapter six. So today we're going to do some problems relating to confidence intervals, power calculations, and the relationship between power and effect sizes. So I'm just going to do some problems and please follow along with me. I'll indicate uh, when you can sort of, I recommend that you do the problems yourself. And before we get started, I recommend that you go onto the Shiny app for the power calculations, which I'm going to post into the chat. So presumably you're at your computer and not on your phone. If you're uh, visiting the class on your phone, take out a laptop or go to your personal computer so that you can use the Shiny app more efficiently. All right, so let's get started. The first bit of news for today that I'll have to send out to the rest of the class is that the second quiz is going to be on Tuesday. Uh, this quiz will be on the topics in chapters four, five, and six. So the uh, z-test of a sample mean, or hold on, was it just chapters five and six? It's either chapters five and six or chapters four, five, and six. I honestly can't remember at the moment, but it's the chapters since the last exam. And it will be on Tuesday, and just like last time, it'll be the first half of the class. By that time, I will be healthy enough, hopefully, in order to come to class and deliver it in person. All right, so let's begin. So everyone get out some paper, pencils, calculators, and we'll do some problems. So this is going to be a little bit more of a kind of chalkboard style lecture. I'm occasionally going to be referring to some of the diagrams in the previous class's lecture, PowerPoints. But for the most part, I'm going to just be writing on this uh, paint app. I'm having some lag issues. Here we are. So just as a quick overview of confidence intervals. Oh, uh, Jen comments in the chat, uh, Tuesday is Easter. Ah, yeah, in that case, uh, we'll have to postpone that until Thursday for eight. Sorry about that. So uh, we'll get a email that is uh, going to be announcing the date and the relevant chapters for the next quiz. It will not be on Tuesday because uh, no one is coming to class on Tuesday, but it will be on Thursday. All right, so let's return. We went over a few problems from the z-test of the sample mean, and I'm going to assume that you still remember stuff, stuff about the sampling distribution and the relationship between the distribution of the population of scores and the sampling distribution. And the confidence interval problems that I'll be giving you, and the simplest form of them, will be using some of those same terms and some of those same ideas. Confidence intervals don't necessarily require you to know or make all of the assumptions from the z-test of the sample mean, but the very easiest version of grasping the concept makes use of those terms. Because it's easier to do the problem at first and you, when you have some assumptions that make the problem simple. So a confidence interval is always going to be a range going from a lower score all the way up to a higher score. So one might say that the 95% confidence interval for a given estimate is between 4 and 12. If we were to say that the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval went from 4 as our lower confidence limit up until 12 as the higher confidence limit, 
it is the probability that the true score, or rather the true population mean, is between those two numbers. So in a confidence interval problem, you are taking your sample mean that you took as a result of sampling from a population, and you are using facts about that sample, such as its standard deviation, as well as assumptions about the population in order to estimate how probable it is that that sample, uh, how probable it is that your original sort of assumption about the population mean that you use for your null hypothesis uh, is likely given the sample mean that you got. So let's do a problem. But before that, just as a means of uh, orienting you to some of the variables that go into a confidence interval problem, know that our confidence interval, it's always going to be, when we're, we're, we're creating a confidence interval, we are going to be creating a sampling distribution that is centered on a sample mean. And so the mean of the distribution that we create is actually the sample mean, not any kind of population mean. And for the sake of these problems, we're going to assume that the standard deviation of the population is known and the sample size is just something you know because when you take a sample, it always has a known sample size. This thing about knowing the standard deviation, that just makes it easier for us to compute the standard error of the mean. So, but not, there are other ways of figuring that out. And the two different kinds of confidence intervals are a 95% confidence interval and a 99% confidence interval. And these refer to how likely it is that given your sample mean of a given sample size with a population with a certain standard deviation contains the mean that you would predict if the null hypothesis was correct. And in relation to the hypothesis tests that we've learned about previously, this version of a confidence interval problem is equivalent to saying, if you create a distribution centered on a sample mean with a known sample size and known standard deviation of a population, this 95% and 99% confidence intervals refer to if, if your null hypothesis falls within the 95% confidence interval or the 99% confidence interval, that means you are going to reject the null hypothesis if it was a statistical test. And the idea is that if there's a 95% chance that you, your sample mean, you would have gotten it just but uh, if there's a 95% chance that the null hypothesis was compatible with your sample mean, then that means it's very likely that the null hypothesis is true because just by random sampling, you're likely to get uh, results that are not exactly the po true population mean all the time. And 99% is just a stricter standard in the same way that choosing an alpha value of 0.05 is a less strict standard than 0.01. And so 0.05 or 5%, that's the equivalent of the 95% confidence interval when applied to interpreting the result. And the 0.01 significance level is equivalent to the 99% confidence interval problems. So let's do an example. Let's say that we have a population mean but let's uh, separate this from any kind of problem that has uh, details to it. And let's just uh, suggest, let's do a problem where I just give you the symbols and we work through them together. Let's say that we have a sample mean of 150. Let's say it's some kind of test and you have a sample mean of 150. This is an uppercase M, not a mu, I know it's a little bit confusing sometimes. Let's make it look more like the uppercase M. 
So we have our sample mean, it's 150. Let's say that in this kind of problem, you expect that the population score is likely to be 100. So your sample mean scored 50 points higher than the population mean that you would expect if the null hypothesis is true. So let's draw a distribution. Can all of you see my screen okay? Yeah. All right, very good. So here is the distribution of scores, aka the population distribution. And the population distribution, it's known to have a mean of 100. And remember that for this simple kind of confidence interval problem, I'm going to tell you what the standard deviation of this distribution is. Let's say that the standard deviation of this distribution is, let's say, 10. So here are the two facts we need to know about this distribution of scores. We know that it has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. So for the sake of this problem, if we were doing a hypothesis test, like we learned about in chapter five, the beginning of chapter five, we would draw underneath this our, dis our sampling distribution, which would also be centered on the mean. Because remember, in, when creating the sampling distribution of a distribution of scores, the distribution of means the mean of the distribution of means, mu m, equals this, the mean of the distribution of scores. That was what we call the rule one. Easy enough. But we're actually not going to be using that right now. I'm just writing that to remind you of that fact. But here, we are still, we are going to be making, for the sake of this confidence interval problem, let me just state what we want to do. I would say, find the 95% confidence interval, CI, for this sample mean. Where the sample mean is 150. And there's actually a fact that I haven't given you yet that's actually related to this problem. Let me actually tell you that the sample size for this mean of 150, so to get this mean of 150, let's say that we sampled 15 people. So the goal is to find the 95% confidence interval for sample mean of 150, and with sample mean of 150, with a sample size of 15, where we are assuming that a null hypothesis would predict a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. So whereas for the z-test of a sample mean, we will have to create a distribution that is centered on this value here, the distribution of mean, the mean of the distribution of means, for the confidence interval problem, we are going to be creating a distribution of means, but not the same distribution of means. So we are going to be creating a distribution that is composed of means, but instead of being centered on this value, mu subscript m, it is just going to be centered on m. So remember, the mean was 150 for our sample. So if we were to draw like tick boxes here where each of these boxes represents, let's say 150 is over here. This is kind of a silly example because you can see that 150 is a very extreme score for a population that has these characteristics. But let's just do the problem anyway. Even though if you observe such an extreme score, in reality, the statistical test is a bit of an afterthought. 
but in terms of this problem, I've set it up this way, so let's continue with it. So if we were to draw a sampling distribution that was centered on 150, which was our mean, we know that sampling distributions are always going to be normally distributed. That was that thing called the central limit theorem that in the long run, if you sampled repeatedly from any population, you would get a sampling distribution that was normally distributed. So for the sake of this, let's draw that. So we have a fact, we have our mean of our sampling distribution. And this is kind of equivalent to what we call the comparison distribution before, but because we're not doing a statistical test, it's technically not a comparison distribution, but it is a distribution of means still. And one of the ways we know we know it's a distribution of means is that a mean is going to be like the, the sample mean is in fact like the basis of this. It's the the mean and it's one of the possible scores. But it's one of the possible sort of things that makes up the distribution. So now that we have our distribution that we'll use to calculate the confidence intervals, remember we actually need to figure out the standard error of the mean of this new distribution. So how do we do that? Remember, the standard error of the mean, or SEM, which is the same as sigma subscript M. It's such a common term that we have SEM as the common abbreviation. Remember that this value is equal to the square root of the variance of this distribution divided by the sample size of the sample mean. So if we wanted to get the variance of this distribution, it would be 10 squared or 100 divided by 15. So we say at the beginning that our sample contained 15 individuals. So by order of operations, we do the exponents. So I have to shamefully take out my calculator to make sure that I can do 100 divided by 15. Yes, it's about 6.7. So square root of 6.7 going to be about 2 point something. I do not want to make a, an error here. And as I've reiterated several times, there is nothing better than Excel as a calculator. So if I want to do the square root of 6.7 equal equal 6.7, you can do a function or you can just do to the power of 0.5 and it's about 2.59. Let's round that to 2.6. So there we go. We've got all that we need in order to do our confidence interval calculations. But what are our confidence interval calculations? We are going to compute two different numbers because the confidence interval is always a uh, like a range of a lower limit and an upper limit. So to compute confidence limit lower, it's simply going to be It is going to be the mean minus 
Oh, sorry, we, we see a step. Hold on a moment. Oh, so the step that we skipped, which is a very important step, is we actually have to figure out what the the z low, the lower z and the upper z are for the 95% integral calculation. Sorry, guys. And remember, the 95% confidence interval is similar in basic concept to the like, sort of 5% uh, significance level with the two-tailed test, but whereas before we wanted to look at, like we cared about the extreme values, the values on the lower tail or the upper tail or both the lower and upper tail. Here we actually care about the values in the middle 95% of the distribution. And if we care about the values in the middle 95% of the distribution, and we want to know the lower Z and the upper Z, if we want to know what these values are, that's something that we have found multiple times before. You could go to the Shiny app for the normal distribution. And if you did this, uh, you would find that the Z lower that marks the lower end of a of such a distribution where the middle is 95% of the total scores, that is equal to minus 1.96. And the Z upper is just the opposite, but in the positive end, plus 1.96. If it was the 99% confidence interval, I believe it would be minus 2.58 and positive 2.58. And in terms of this sort of problem, those are the only numbers you'll ever need to know because no one's ever going to ask you for like the 60% confidence interval or the 50% confidence interval. It'll all be the 95% or 99%. So now we have all of the information that we need to compute our confidence interval. So let's compute the confidence limit. Let me just write that term. I know it's confusing that we talk about a confidence interval being the range between a upper and lower confidence limit, but those are just the terms. So the confidence interval is lower confidence limit dash upper confidence limit. So CL lower equals mean minus Z lower times the standard error of the mean. Well, it, it's actually like plus. Well, let's, let's, you'll see that because this, uh, the only difference between the two calculations is the Z lower is as a negative Z score. Let's just do it as plus and just make it cal calculation, same calculation for them both. Gosh, I can't talk. So our mean was 150. And then to that, we add the product of minus 1.96 and 2.6. And if we were to do this, minus 1.96 times 2.6. It's about 5.1. So 150 minus 5.1 equals about 144.9. And the confidence limit upper is going to be the same calculation, except instead of the lower z, we're going to be doing with the upper z. Okay. 
but everything else in the calculation remains the same. We're still going to be using the sample mean, and we're going to be using the same standard error of the mean. So every other number remains the same, 150 plus, instead of minus 1.96, plus 1.96. And we're still going to be multiplying by the standard error of the mean. And last time, this was minus 5.1. And here, it's plus 5.1. And we have 155.1 as our upper confidence limit. So to bring this home, we will say that 95%, I'll let me just uh, write this in a more typical way. The way that this is often going to be written is CI, and then either in a subscript or in a parentheses, 95%. equals 144.9 to 155.1. So remember, back at the very beginning of this problem, where I wasn't very uh, thoughtful in terms of trying to make this into a kind of a realistic problem where there's a chance that you might kind of, uh, I, I made the sample mean compared to the population mean into like, it's very obviously a very extreme score. When you have a uh, population mean of 100 with a standard deviation of 10, a score of 150 is five standard deviations away from the, the mean, which is an insanely unlikely score. But, and that's actually reflected by the fact that the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval goes from 144.9 to 155.1 and our sample mean was 100. And if our sample mean was 100, the interpretation of this would be that if we would expect a true population mean of a sample with these characteristics coming from a population with these characteristics to 95% of the time, the true population mean, we'd find it between 144.9 and 155.1. The fact that the population mean that was predicted by the null hypothesis was 100, which is way outside the range of 144.9 to 155.1, means that it is insanely unlikely that the true population mean of a sample with these properties would come from a distribution with these properties. So if you were to ask, if you were to state the result of the confidence interval calculation, it would be something like there is 95% probability that a sample these characteristics coming from a population with standard deviation of 10. would would contain the true population mean. So this concept of a true population mean is pretty important because in all the problems that we've worked with so far, prior to the confidence interval problems, I told you, or the textbook told you, what the characteristics of the population distribution of scores actually was. Like you were told, in this case, that the population mean was 100, and it had a standard deviation of 10. In reality, 
you almost never know real facts about the population. And it's very annoying that you don't know real facts about the population because ideally, what you care about is understanding the population that your sample came from. And what we have to do outside of these kind of simplified problems is make assumptions about the population based on basically our best guesses. The confidence interval tells us that if we made an assumption about the population that its mean was 100, and we turn that into our null hypothesis, where if there was no effect or no difference between groups, whatever the case may be, if our prediction about the population was that it has a true mean of 100, then it's incredibly unlikely that a sample mean would actually have, a sample mean of 150 would contain that value of 100. That value of 100 as a population mean is incredibly unlikely. And the fact that this 95% confidence interval does not contain a mean of 100, that this kind of the statement that the a mean of 100 is not contained by a 95% confidence interval, that is actually the equivalent thing of saying is that is equivalent as saying, if we did a two-tailed test with an alpha value of 0.05, where with a sample mean of these same characteristics, we would reject the null hypothesis, where in such a problem, the null hypothesis would be uh, that our sample comes from a population distribution with mean of 100 and standard deviation of 10. And the fact that the 95% confidence interval doesn't contain a mean of 100, that strongly implies that the sample mean did not come from a population with these characteristics. So that is the equivalence between the z-test and the sample mean and the confidence interval, but the confidence interval can tell you a little bit more. Uh, what else is there to say here? Ah, that's right. Imagine for a second we were to change this mean of 150 to a mean of 110. Hold on, I forgot how to change the colors. So let's imagine a different version of this problem where all of the assumptions were the same. We are still assuming that the population mean is 100 and the standard deviation of that population distribution is 10. Imagine if the mean was 110 with a, standard, with a sample size of 15. How do you think that would affect the confidence interval? And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take five minutes to compute the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval, for a mean of 110 with these same uh, sort of parameters of the problem. And the question I want you to think about when you get to the end is, does the confidence interval contain the population mean predicted by the null hypothesis? And let's say that's just like four, U of 100. 
when you finish the problem, uh, write in the chat what you think the confidence interval is. All right, it's been nearly five minutes. So I'm guessing that many of you, by the time you got to the end of the problem, if you did it from the beginning, realized that when you're comparing the confidence limits of uh, a different, so the only thing that is changing is the, the sample mean that you're comparing, all you would need to do is go at, down to everything up until uh, these two confidence limit calculations is the same because in terms of figuring out what the uh, standard error of the mean is, that's all the same. The only difference would be that instead of a mean centered on 150, it would be centered on 110. And instead of 150 here, it would be 110. So those of you who did that, correctly saw that you would get a range of 104.9 and then 115.1. So if we have new values going from 104.9 to 115.1, does that include the null hypothesis or the value predicted by the null hypothesis. That's right, it does not. So 104.9 to 115.1 does not include 100. 100 is more extreme or outside the 95% interval range and this is because, well, it's not, it's no reason necessarily. It's just that when the sample mean is closer to our predicted population mean, if the null hypothesis was true, it means that it's going to be closer 
to it, it compared comparing 150 as our sample mean to 110 you can see that the range even though it does not actually include a sample mean of 100 it is way closer to the sample mean of 100 than the, when the sample mean was 150. So now this tells you something about the confidence interval calculations and let's actually just uh, it, it, well, I won't do the whole thing because I'm pretty sure you can easily imagine if I change the sample mean from 110 to uh, 102 or 105, if I lowered it more so that it was closer to the sample mean that would be predicted by the, it, it was closer to the population mean that we predicted the null hypothesis was true, then we would find that 95% confidence interval would overlap a mean of 100. So if the sample mean we got with a sample size of 15 was 102, then our lower confidence limit would be 102 minus 5.1, which is about, I think, 97.9. And this would be 107.1. And it goes from like 97 to 107, then that range of values would include the population mean predicted by the null hypothesis. And if we were doing a z-test of that sample mean, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So that goes to show that for confidence interval problems, the confidence interval is more likely to include the sample mean if the sample mean is closer, just as a value, to our predicted population. But now let's actually try varying this up a little bit farther. I want you now to do this problem where let's assume that we have a sample mean of 110. And we found that with the sample mean of 110, the confidence interval did not, still did not include the predicted population mean of 100. But now let's actually imagine that we change the sample size so that instead of having a sample size of 15, we have a sample size of five. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to do the problem again, this time with a smaller sample size, and tell me what the new confidence interval is. Is the I'll mean you... still Oh, I'm sorry? I had a question. Uh, is the mean still 110? Yes, uh, for this new problem, uh, let's keep the mean at 110. Thank you. Uh, 150 was just something I chose arbitrarily at the beginning. It's way too far away. There's no kind of like change in the parameters of the problem that's going to result in the confidence interval like overlapping the predicted mean. So yes, for this version of the problem, continue with 110. I'll give you four or five minutes to do that. <laughs> 
All right. So the answers I see in the chat match mine as well. So when we lowered the pot, when we lowered the sample size for a sample mean with a mean of 110 to from 15 to 5, the only thing that changed in the sequence of steps was this. Well, the first thing that changed was the calculation of the standard error for mean. So instead of 15, it became 5. So instead of 100 divided by 15, it became 100 divided by 5. And instead of taking the square root of 20, we take the square root of 7. Sorry, instead of taking the square root of 6.7, we take the square root of 20, which let me just make sure that I get that right as well. It's about 4.47. And notice that when we decrease the sample size, we increased the standard error of the mean, which is to say we increased the variability or variance of our distribution, our sampling distribution. Because when the standard error of the mean is larger, that means that there's more variance in this distribution. That should have some kind of intuitive sense to it because when you, have, when you take a smaller sample size, you have less confidence that the sample that you took is actually like representative of the population. You're more likely to get an extreme score when you're sampling from a smaller population than from a larger, or from a sorry. You're more likely to get an extreme score if you sample from a small sample than from a large sample. And that reduced confidence that you have is represented in the fact that the variance of your comparison distribution or the distribution of the means is higher. So nearly double. And from here, what would change is instead of multiplying our z scores in the second part of the formula by 2.6, thereby 4.7, 4.47, sorry. And if you go through with all of these, we get 101.2 as our lower confidence limit and 118.8 as our larger confidence limit. And so the way we would express this is the confidence interval, 95% equals 101.2 to 118.8. So for this problem, did the Population mean predicted by the null hypothesis overlap with our confidence interval? No. It was 100, and the confidence interval was started at 101. So, although in the context of a hypothesis testing problem where we were testing a sample mean with a mean of 110 and a sample size of 5, if we had chosen a alpha of 0.05, we would still have rejected the null hypothesis. However, let's actually observe something about the difference between this confidence interval, where the sample size was 5, and the previous confidence interval we calculated, where the sample size was 15. So 104.9 to 115.1 is about 10 units apart. So the sample, the confidence interval of is about uh, 10 units apart. However, when the sample size is 5 instead of 15, the difference is about 17 points. So the confidence interval, the range, is larger when the sample size is smaller. And that's similar to the concept behind standard error of the mean being larger, where it refers to, the, it's the idea is that the, the confidence interval is going to be larger when the sample size is smaller, because when we take small samples, we are less confident that the samples are representative of the population. You're more likely to get extreme scores and you're not as confident. So the confidence interval is larger because we have less confidence that our sample is representative of the population. 
So this page is getting a little bit messy right now. But let's imagine that, let's do one more example. Let's consider for a moment whether that instead of a sample mean, oh sorry, instead of a standard deviation of our population distribution of 10, we instead had a standard deviation of 25. So let's say that this value here is now 25. And I want you to use uh, 110 and 5 and now 25. So just with each time we did it, we changed one more thing. And actually, not only do I want you to change this to, actually, let's just do 25 first. So do the same thing, same problem, mean of 110, sample size of five, but now the standard deviation that we predicted for our distribution of scores is 25 instead of Please calculate the confidence interval. We've been working. All right, uh, post your answers in the chat when you think you've got it. All right, so when we changed these values from 10 to 25, the thing that changes first when doing the problem is when calculating the standard error of the mean, where before it was 100 because it was 10 squared as this term for the variance of the distribution of scores. Now instead of 10 squared, it's 25 squared. So 25 times 25, I used to know this in my head, but now I have to shamefully go to Excel. 25 squared, 625. So now we have, instead of 100 divided by five, 625 divided by five. And 625 divided by five, is 125. Yeah. So 125, uh, the square root of 125 is about 11.18. 
So by changing, or rather by increasing, the standard deviation of the population of scores, you see how it had a very big effect on the standard error of the mean that we calculated. So by predicting that the population of scores has a larger standard deviation, it leads to the standard error of the mean calculation also being larger. Because the standard error of the mean is proportional to the standard deviation of the distribution of scores. So that is another factor when doing a calculation for confidence intervals. And this particular question or this particular issue kind of propagates further in the problem so that instead of the previous uh, standard error of the mean of 0.47 for the previous problem, it's now 11.18, and then same here. So we've got 88.1 as our lower confidence limit, and we have 131.95 as our upper confidence limit. And finally, we have a confidence limit that includes the population mean predicted by the null hypothesis. And if we were doing a, uh, what's it called? Z-test of a sample mean hypothesis testing procedure for a sample mean of 110 with a sample size of five, with a population mean with a known, well, a null hypothesis distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 25, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. I can just tell you that for sure. And the reason why I'm so sure that we would fail to reject the null hypothesis is that when we calculate the 95% confidence interval of such a problem, this range of 88.1 to 131.5 includes our population mean of 100. So because 100 is included in this 95% confidence interval calculation, I know that if I did the z-test of a sample mean for such a sample, I'd reject the null hypothesis. So the very last thing that's a consideration for the confidence interval problems is the choice of a 95% confidence interval or a 99% confidence interval. So a 99% confidence interval, I won't have you do the problem, but if we were to do the problem, and the only difference after you sort of kept all the changes that I've done so far, is you changed our 95% confidence interval to a 99% confidence interval, what would change would actually occur in these values here, Z lower and Z upper, because in this case, our distribution of means centered on the sample mean would look like this. It would look well the same in terms of whatever the sample mean is centered on. So it would be, oops. It would be a mean of 110. Oh my, my tablet is struggling. All right, so it would still have a mean of 110, which was our sample mean, but instead of the middle 95% of the distribution caring about that, it would be the middle 99% of the distribution. And this would affect our Z upper. This would be plus 2.58. And our Z lower would just be Z of minus 2.58 because that is the, uh, those are the z-scores that include the middle 99% of the distribution. And just to remind you, if the middle 99% of a two-tailed distribution or two-tailed uh, distribution of this sort has 99% of the values, that means the upper tail has 0.05% and the lower tail has 0.05% because the upper and the lower tail have to include the same amount as they're symmetrical and they have to sort of include the 
that's not in the center of the distribution. And so if you were to choose z-scores, it is since the 99% confidence interval has us using z-scores that are larger than 1.96, it would mean that this value here, this uh, thing that I'm putting a rectangle around, this would be larger. So whenever you change from a 95% confidence interval to a 99% confidence interval, your confidence interval will always be larger than if your confidence interval is based on 95% alone. So let's just actually do the comparison here. So I know this is getting uh, pretty wacky. So we have 88.1 80, to 131.95 for a 95% confidence interval. But if we did 99% confidence interval, this is another way it's written, CI and then underscore 99%. Sorry, not underscore, just a subscript. 110 plus. One hundred ten plus two point five eight times. I've already forgotten what the second item was. It was eleven point one eight. So we have one hundred thirty eight. And just to quickly find out what the upper value should be. Oh, sorry, that, that was the upper value. So we need so 81.16. So the goes from 81.16 up to 138.8. So if we were to compare this confidence interval going from 81 as the lower confidence limit up to 138 as the upper confidence limit, both the lower confidence limit, the lower confidence limit is lower than for the 95% confidence interval, all other things being held equal. And the upper confidence limit is larger than that, uh, that of the 99% confidence interval. And essentially, if the goal is to check to see whether the predicted population mean, if the null hypothesis was true, is contained in the confidence interval, and if it's not, you reject the null hypothesis, 99% confidence interval, you're more likely to have your confidence interval include your predicted population mean, and hence you are less likely to reject the null hypothesis. And this is exactly the same logic behind why it's easier to reject the null hypothesis when alpha is 0.05 compared to 0.01. So that's some confidence interval calculations. And confidence interval calculations are going to pop up repeatedly. So for now, let me just save that. And let's do some power calculations. All right, so statistical power. In many ways, it's uh, a similar kind of set of concepts to the confidence interval calculations. The goal for power calculations and effect sizes also asks you to consider things like, well, what happens if I change the sample size? Or what happens if I change the uh, alpha value? Or what happens if I decide to do a one-tailed test instead of a two-tailed test? And understanding how all of these choices affect statistical power is very important. So what is statistical power? Simply being able to sort of state the definition as though you like memorized it on a flashcard is really, really useful. 
and there are two aspects of the definition. The first definition is just the mathematical definition. It is one minus beta. Where can anyone tell me what beta was? This is from a conversation about different kinds of errors and decision errors in the null hypothesis significance testing framework. The chance of um, having a type two error. Perfect. So beta equals the probability of type two error. And a type two error, just to give that definition, it is a error that you make when you fail to reject the null hypothesis but null hypothesis is false. So that's the definition of a type two error. You fail to reject the null hypothesis with your statistical test, but in reality, the null hypothesis is false. So that's, that's, that, it's not a mistake because it's not necessarily the same wrong. It's just that sometimes that's the way things shake out when you do a problem or do a, a study. Sometimes you get a result that is not, it leads you to a conclusion that is opposite to what is true in reality. So this definition of statistical power as one minus beta, so literally the inverse of beta, this actually leads us to the word definition or the, the sort of the description of statistical power in the same kind of language as the type two error rate. Sorry, someone's trying to call me. I'm just gonna turn them off. So statistical power is if the research hypothesis is true what is the probability that your study will reject the null hypothesis. I can actually just avoid framing this as a question. If the research this is true, statistical power is the probability that your study will reject the null hypothesis. So it's worth taking like a little time just to reflect on how this one minus beta is actually sort of, these concepts are kind of the two, these are two mutually exclusive situations where the null hypothesis, if uh, say, it, it's easier if I sort of rephrase the second part of the definition of type two error as the research hypothesis is true. It's not exact, but it's close enough. So if you, you either fail to reject the null, that's the type two error rate. If the null hypothesis is false, the research hypothesis is true. And statistical power is, you're also assuming that the research hypothesis is true, but it's the probability that you will reject the null hypothesis. So the same kind of situation, you're assuming the research hypothesis is true, but beta is you fail to reject the null hypothesis, that's the probability that you'll fail to reject. And statistical power is the probability that you will in fact reject the null hypothesis. So that's what it means by statistical power being the inverse of beta and statistical power being one minus beta because they are uh, sort of the two possibilities. And as the probability, uh, as beta increases, the power increases. And you want to 
increase power, but you also want to avoid type two errors. So it's, it's very frustrating because uh, statistical power is a concept that one of the key aspects of it is that there is an assumption baked into it. The assumption is that if the research hypothesis is true, here's the probability that you'll reject the null hypothesis. But in reality, sometimes you do a study and the research hypothesis isn't true. Your hypothesis is incorrect. But you're assuming for the sake of the statistical power calculation that it is true. But just know that that doesn't necessarily reflect just because statistical power assumes that your research hypothesis is true doesn't mean it actually is. So in terms of statistical power, we definitely won't have time to do another full problem, but I do want to list all of the factors that sort of come into play when doing a power calculation. And that's the name of this genre. It's power calculation. Sometimes power calculations, when it's for a certain kind of study, is also called a power analysis. Maybe later in the semester, I'll, so I'll tell you about a program that's free. It's called G Power. If you're really interested in sort of getting a head start, you can download it yourself for a Mac or PC. But the power calculation or power analysis is something that is done in two different situations. Remember, there's kind of evaluating power of existing study. So a study's already been done. And the other problem, uh, the other possibility is you are you are designing a study that has yet to be done and figuring out the power. And then I'll put it in parentheses so that you can decide whether the experiment is worth doing. I included some quotes in the last lecture about how there's no point in doing a study that has low power because even if you're correct about like an effect being in the world or a difference existing between two groups if your power is low that means that even if you kind of fail to reject the null hypothesis you have no confidence that uh, failing to reject it means that it was likely to have been untrue. And if you recall, in terms of which is the kind of better place to be, evaluating the power of a study that's already been done or designing a study and trying to figure out the power ahead of time so that you uh, make sure that it has enough power and it's worth doing in the first place, it's much better to be in this situation. Especially if the two studies in consideration are ones that you've done. If you have done a study, and then after the fact, you're looking at the study and its uh, characteristics and finding the power, you'd be really disappointed to find that a study that failed to reject the null hypothesis uh, had very, very low power because you think to yourself, oh man, if only I had done this power analysis in advance, I wouldn't have done the study at all because I wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't have been confident in the results even if I got these same results. All right, so, Power calculation has a whole bunch of factors. And unlike confidence intervals, which kind of exist in a parallel universe to the uh, null hypothesis significance testing approach, power analysis is very, very much tied into the null hypothesis significance testing. And it often is a missing ingredient in null hypothesis significance testing discussion. So just some of the factors that we'll talk about next time include choice of alpha value, 
So for instance, 0.05 versus 0.01. We'll talk about which is likely to result in more or less power. Another factor is sample size. Higher versus lower. So just like with confidence intervals, one thing we have to consider is the population standard deviation. So another consideration is the type of tail test. And there, it's a matter of one-tailed versus two-tailed. And the next, we have the either, depending on whether you're evaluating existing study or designing a potential study, we're going to be dealing with effect size. And then I'm going to put observed effect size. And that's uh, what happens if you do a study and you uh, have the ability to just calculate an effect size that is just there to be calculated. Or predicted effect size. And that's when you are designing a study in advance. And remember, when we talk about effect sizes, uh, these are a function of two different factors. One is uh, the it's difficult to say. I'm considering making this a separate bullet point, but let's actually just put this together. One is let's just actually for now say small, medium, or large effect size. And leave it at that for now. And this is all of the factors that go into calculating statistical power. And in terms of uh, this class, I want you to know, for the sake of uh, this class, how varying all of these factors, such as the effect size, type of tail test, standard deviation of the population distribution, sample size, and alpha value. How do these affect power calculation? And not only do how they affect power calculation, let me just write this down. How do these parameters affect power? Which of these are based on choices of the experimenter or whoever is like designing or evaluating studies versus set up in advance. So an example of the factor that is set up in advance would definitely be the alpha value. So if you're choosing uh, the alpha value as 0.05 or 0.01, that's something that the experimenter decides in advance. But there are other things that are the result of, kind of things that the experimenter doesn't have much control over, such as population standard deviation. All right, so that's the end of today's class. Uh, today, I remembered to uh, record the lesson. So if you want to go back to today's lesson, I'll post it on YouTube immediately. And uh, I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, talk to you guys soon.